So without further ado, I will invite Dr. Jim Brink up to the podium, who is the first speaker, and he's, going, he's from Yale University, many of you know him. He's going to be t- speaking on CT imaging, the benefits are worth the responsibilities. Thank you very much, Tony, and good, mor- <coughs> good morning. Are we all set here? Let's see. In the next 30 minutes or so, I have the pleasure of addressing you really about what uh, CT brings to the table in the clinical arena, and it brings a lot, but it also has some important responsibilities. I'd like to begin by acknowledging a uh, many-year collaboration with my vice chair, uh, Dr. Rob Goodman, who we recruited from England uh, several years ago, and and he brings a very interesting perspective to this topic from across the pond, if you will, and I'll, I'll try and bring in some of those perspectives throughout my talk. There's no question that CT is a really, really important tool to us as clinicians. It affords superb anatomic depiction of the entire body, from the head to the toe, allowing us to both confirm or exclude innumerable diagnoses on a minute-by-minute basis worldwide. And for many years, radiologists have relied on their understanding of three-dimensional anatomy to help us bring two-dimensional images to a three-dimensional realm. And so I could pick one of thousands and thousands of cases to illustrate this point, and I just picked this one by chance. It shows a mass centered in a structure that I know to exist between the stomach and the liver, the lestromentum or gastrohepatic ligament. And thinking in three dimensions, as I look in two dimensions, I can extrapolate that this mass is either arising from the liver or arising from the stomach with which it is contiguous. And in fact, this was a liver mass, a a hepatoma, invading that ligament, that structure, and the adjacent stomach. But I understand these these, uh, relationships because that's what radiologists do. They integrate two dimensions to three. But the advances in CT have helped us a lot, and I'd show you this case just from this past weekend when I was on call, which illustrates the benefit of multiplanar reformations. A very large dilated uh, sigmoid colon and a classic bird's beak appearance that we used to see with barium enemas, and now we see with CT scans, which confirms a sigmoid volvulus, or twist of the sigmoid colon. And so multiplanar imaging, advancing our ability to leverage imaging to diagnosis. Well, in addition to these obvious progression, this obvious progression from two to three dimensions, we also have many applications that have spun from that. Many years ago, the flank pain CT scan, really shortening the time interval between a patient presenting with flank pain and a diagnosis of an obstructing stone, for example, previously requiring the intravenous urogram. CT colonoscopy or colonography, providing a non-invasive way of imaging polyps and cancers of the colon, and CT angiography of just about every organ or vascular territory uh, imaginable, including the coronary arteries. And beginning simply with the, the flank pain CT, again, shortening the time to make a diagnosis of a stone obstructing the ureter, as in this patient uh, with a stone impacted at the left ureteral vesicle junction. And even the edema in the trigone of the bladder surrounding that stone, beautifully depicted with uh, CT. CT colonography. Uh, polyps rendered with virtual imaging and aluminal perspective volume rendering, which rivals that of optical colonoscopy, and being able to register that with the multiplanar reformations to precisely localize these tumors or these lesions. And then combining that technology with the gaming industry, advances that we see all of our kids playing on video games applies to this technology as well. And I just illustrate one, which is a mist patch tool invented to try and color code mucosa that was not seen prospectively on a fly-through from the other direction, but recognize what you missed when you could turn around and go back the opposite direction. Again, the gaming industry applied to CT data gave us 3D renderings of exquisite quality. Here of the neck showing us the thyroid gland and all the related vasculature. And... Uh, very practical applications. This patient with trauma and a jumped facet, a fracture dislocation of the neck here on the left at C45. You see the vertebral artery is occluded in the intervertebral foramina, reconstituting about the C2 level and going up. On the normal side, you see it throughout its course, normal in appearance. And other complex vascular injuries associated with trauma. Here's a patient with a motor, from a motorcycle accident, a highly comminuted fracture of the tibia and fibula, The vasculature is beautifully depicted relative to those bony landmarks, and we can, in fact, see that the uh, anterior tibial artery is occluded across that fracture, reconstituting distally. The coronary arteries, a new frontier for CT imaging. 
leveraging the high negative predictive value of this test, we can exclude coronary disease or even occluded stents in patients who've had prior therapy, as in this case, as being the cause of a patient's uh, chest pain. And plaque, both soft and hard plaque, can be illustrated here. Color-coded, you see the soft plaque is this gray, and the hard plaque is the more uh, densely calcified portion, I'm, albeit with a bit of manual help, but color-coding to help show that uh, the extent of both soft and hard plaque in that coronary artery. And again, a diffuse soft plaque all along the coronary artery here. I think you can see it, perhaps not from the back of the room, but with color-coding again, showing both the extent of soft and hard plaque in the left anterior descending coronary artery. And a new frontier is the triple rule-out exam, the ability to evaluate and exclude uh, the big three causes of chest pain, aortic dissection, coronary artery disease, and pulmonary emboli, all from a single injection of contrast in a matter of seconds. It's really a truly remarkable, remarkable test, and one that has really not caught on yet, uh, both nationally and worldwide, but it really does have the potential to greatly improve our ability to evaluate patients with chest pain. And if it's not coronary artery disease, it could be one of these other diagnoses, such as a type B aortic dissection as shown here, emanating and originating just beyond the origin of the left subclavian artery and extending down the descending aorta, both on that volume-rendered view and on this multiplanar view. Highly uh, accurate depiction of the anatomy and of the diagnosis or pulmonary emboli. The CT is virtually replaced in, many, in most instances, the uh, nuclear medicine equivalent, the ventilation perfusion scan, with a precise depiction of the actual embolus itself, as shown here on the left, these two emboli. And if axial imaging alone isn't, help, isn't sufficient, because sometimes lymph nodes can volume average with those uh, vessels and, be, and mimic emboli, we can do reformations and really confirm that, in fact, the embolus is truly located within the vessel uh, of interest. And so with that uh, great advance, we've also have the potential to just get a little carried away. And this next example, I think, shows us kind of how we might have gotten a little carried away as recently as four or five years ago. This was from uh, one particular vendor sort of in, 19, in 2004, sort of highlighting sort of the future of medical imaging by fusing a PET-CT with the FDG avid colon cancer here, superimposed with a CT colonography study, and then uh, fused further with a CT angiogram effectively four doses of ionizing radiation, but for what benefit? I mean, it really didn't add anything other than we knew there was a colon cancer there to begin with. And that's the rub. That's the responsibility because it is a fantastic test, and yet it does have the potential for us to just overuse it and perhaps use it inappropriately. And because of that, we've really seen, because of both the good and possibly the bad, we've seen the collective dose to our population rising. CT is a higher dose examination than the plain films that it might replace, and it's replaced many plain film examinations, particularly of the spine in our emergency rooms. The increasing number of indications, the availability, the ease of use, and the speed have all really facilitated a really marked increase in the use of this uh, important technology. And that exponential curve, I think, is also mirrored in just the growth of the numbers of scans from the early 80s to the mid-2000s, almost a similar exponential rise in, in growth. Now, the media has been an important watchdog for us, and uh, suffice it to say that many articles we've seen almost on a weekly basis lately. Uh, But this one in 2007, I think, really got everyone's attention while we were at the RSNA that year, unnecessary CT scans uh, exposing patients to excessive radiation. And the uh, third paragraph down really highlights the issue. About one-third of all CT scans that are done right now are medically unnecessary, even though this was not the point of the article for which this article was, was referencing. It does highlight to us really the call to arms when it comes to utilization. There's no question that the technology needs to be controlled. And in fact, that's the point of this meeting. You all are here to really do a really good job with item number one here, which is to help us tailor the exams to the patients and the applications to limit the dose as much as possible. And so I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about points two and point three, which is how to use CT and what can we do to try and use CT most appropriately. Well, the first thing to consider is where does CT fall with respect to other tests that may not use ionizing radiation, and when do we, and how do we know which one is most appropriate? And happily, here in the U.S., we have a, a wonderful uh, uh, effort put on through the American College of Radiology over the past many, many years to develop appropriateness criteria for our imaging tests. And I don't know how familiar you are with this, so let me just orient you to how this is organized. The appropriateness criteria 
are divided according to topics, such as hematemesis, which is throwing up blood, for those who aren't familiar, uh, blunt abdominal trauma, for example, uh, hematuria, blood in the urine. And basically, there are 167 topics uh, such as these. And then there are many variants for each topic. And I show you one example here, which is in the setting of hematemesis, no history of alcoholism or liver disease. And uh, there are over 800 variants within the appropriateness criteria table. And then for each combination of topic and variant, then there are many possible imaging tests that can be considered. These are listed here. And then there are appropriateness or numbers that show the relative importance or appropriateness of each of those tests on a scale of one to nine, nine being the most appropriate and one being the least appropriate. So in total today, there are 7,700, excuse me, 7,578 combinations of topics, variants, and imaging tests. CT is listed as a possible test in 931 of those, or about 12%, which interestingly represents a similar number as to the number of uh, ionizing uh, imaging tests for which CT is represented in the, the country as evidenced through the NCRP report from 2006. Although they're measuring two different things, it's kind of so interesting it's the same number. And so just to show you what it looks like if you actually use the tool uh, through the ACR website, this is the same scenario. This is the uh, topic of hematemesis, the variant of no alcoholism or liver disease. And note that in this case, CT is not the most appropriate test. It's, um, it ranks below arteriography and nuclear medicine imaging and, and plane radiography. So it's important to recognize that there are tools to say, okay, this is not the the best test necessarily for this uh, clinical scenario. Note also that the appropriateness criteria list a relative radiation level here on the right. And this is really intended to educate the practitioners about relative exposure to radiation from each of the tests that we offer. And every instance where this is shown in each, uh, each appropriateness criteria table is accompanied by a description of what this means and a table that shows what each of these monikers relates to in terms of dose for those who are more, more savvy with it. Now, in the setting of a blunt abdominal trauma, note that uh, we can have three uh, 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 scenarios, an unstable patient for which CT ranks below ultrasound and plane radiography. We know this in our practice because in the trauma that are patients that are unstable, a fast ultrasound exam and a, perhaps a plane radiograph before going to the operating room is most appropriate, but most centers would view it incorrect to take the time to do a CT scan if, in fact, there's blood in the abdomen and the patient's unstable. Conversely, in stable patients with hematuria, CT ranks number nine. It is the most appropriate test uh, for these, uh, this scenario, and even without hematuria, in the setting of blunt abdominal trauma, CT is the most appropriate test. So CT is listed as a 7, 8, or 9 in about 30% of instances in which it is a possible test, and it is the highest ranking uh, test in about 12%. Again, curious that number keeps popping up, but it's in 12% of uh, instances in which it is a possible test. It is the best one uh, and uh, highest ranked at number 9 in 12%. In some instances, it may be the best in rank number 8, and I'm not showing you that statistic. Let's look at some axioms. The first axiom I like to put forth is that in high-risk patients, CT should be avoided when an ultrasound or MRI is of comparable diagnostic utility. And by high-risk patients, I'm really considering children and another population uh, that I think warrants attention, and that's the pregnant uh, female who has right lower quadrant pain. Many years ago, we started doing MRI instead of CT for this indication because it works so well, and there's no reason not to. Uh, we've been doing this for many years, and if a, a pregnant woman has right lower quadrant pain that might be appendicitis, we do a few sequences with MRI. No intravenous injection of contrast is needed. The patient's off the scanner in 10 or 15 minutes, and we can readily identify a dilated appendix such as this filled with appendicolis, indicative of uh, appendicitis. And we can also find confounding diagnoses, such as in this patient who has an obstructing stone in the ureter, which is evident on the same images. And so this requires a little bit more commitment of resources because to do this test, I need to have my body imaging crew on call, including myself, to read these in the middle of the night from our homes. I can't rely on our ER crew necessarily to be able to do this, but we feel that it's worth it in this population. And it's supported by the appropriateness criteria. If you look up right lower quadrant pain in a pregnant women who also have fever and leukocytosis, you'll see that, in fact, CT is ranked below ultrasound, if you can do one, or MRI, uh, for the reasons I've just shown you. And so, again, the appropriateness criteria can help justify the, the, pa- the practice patterns and help guide our referring physicians to the appropriate tests uh, for their patients. 
Now, what about asymptomatic patients or screening exams? Here, we don't have appropriateness criteria so much, but we do rely on analyses such as this, and which showed that, the, that really compared the risk versus benefit from radiation anyway for CT colonography. And interestingly, the lead author is, the, is uh, David Brenner, who's uh, also been in the press a lot for some other articles he's written. This one doesn't get in the press very often, and it's a shame because he really examined this carefully and said, well, gee, the anticipated lifetime risk of colorectal cancer is 5 to 6%. The potential risk of a radiation-induced cancer from CT colonography in a 50-year-old, which is when screening is recommended, is 0.14%, and that's a worse case. It's based on linear no-threshold hypothesis with doses that were in, in use in 2005, and those have been reduced much further since then. And for a 70-year-old, it's 0.07%, and so he concluded that the risks substantially outweigh the, excuse me, the benefits that substantially outweigh the risks, at least from radiation, when it comes to this imaging test. The next principle, I think, and this is probably the most difficult one, is to avoid unnecessary and or repetitive studies. Oftentimes, these are synonymous. I am an adult and a physician. I don't need your approval for CT scans that are necessary for my patients. And uh, this was actually said to me when I was trying to have a discussion about radiation exposure and repetitive imaging with one of our ER physicians, and I actually think I heard her foot hit the floor when she said that, but... I guess it's my revenge because I'm showing you, so that's okay, you know. <laughs> but this is our challenge because, boy, it's a, it's a tough issue. Um, I'm proud of the NCRP for taking this on. In uh, September, they held a summit to try and bring together emergency medicine uh, leaders and radiology leaders to really have a dialogue, a two-day dialogue, about how do we get our hands around the overutilization of CT in uh, the emergency room. And to show you how much of a chasm exists between... Uh, these groups, and even an educational chasm, one of the leaders from emergency medicine was trying to show the group how enlightened he was about this issue, and he said, you know, when I'm imaging a, uh, a CT, I'm performing a CT scan on a child, I tell the mother, of course, of course I tell the mother that there's a risk of mental retardation from the CT scan. And our jaws just dropped, and we said, what are you, what are you talking about? And he said, well, of course, and he referenced some paper that was, in re- that was in relative to radiation therapy of the brain, not diagnostic CT. And even that's kind of controversial, but the point is, is he didn't understand the huge magnitude and difference in dose, and this was one of the enlightened folks. So to su- suffice it to say that we really need to, uh, to focus on education. This next data I'm actually somewhat embarrassed about because it comes from Yale, and it was six years ago now, and so I actually hope that our physicians and our radiologists would do better today than they did six years ago. But to try and get our hands around this, we asked everybody in the emergency room, the patients, the referring physicians, the radiologists, just how much radiation they were experiencing from that abdominal CT scan they were getting for abdominal pain. And we asked, because we knew most of them would not be facile with radiation dosimetry, we just asked it in terms of a comparator, namely how many chestic rays would this be equivalent to. And the correct answer was 100 to 250, but you can see that most of the referring physicians, radiologists, which I'm a little embarrassed about, and and patients all thought it was 1 to 10. Again, I think our physicians and our radiologists would do better today. I mean, we've certainly come a long way in the past six years, but it just shows how far off we were. This is about the same time as I showed you that multimodality fusion exam from just five or six years ago. Now, in Europe, interestingly, we're... They're way ahead of the game in this regard. When my vice chair, Rob Goodman, joined us five or six years ago, he said, you know, my job here is so easy. All I have to do is protocol and read the studies. I'm no longer legally responsible to, to ensure that the test is appropriate. I'm no longer legally responsible to ensure that the dose that I administer fits within the stated guidelines. And in the U.K., they established those guidelines in the year 2000 the Ionizing Radiation Medical Exposures Regulations, and that was in response to the Council for the European Union in 1997 issuing a directive to require all member countries and states to develop such guidelines and and, uh, regulations. And so I'd say, uh, given the the time frame here, we're probably 10 to 15 years uh, behind our European colleagues. I can tell you I I spent some time in London in the early 90s focusing on uh, spiral CT, helping get uh, spiral CT implemented there, and it, we were vastly different in our appreciation. For me, radiation, radiation, I didn't really care. And my European colleagues were much, much more concerned about the, uh, the effects of ionizing radiation. CT should be avoided when the benefit is marginal. And that is a, a, uh, an important axiom as well. 
And here I, I highlight for you the, the flank pain CT, invented at Yale, a wonderful test, no question, but one that has just caught on and probably been overused uh, as much, if not more, than any other test. Uh, over a six-year period at our institution, 4,500 patients got 5,500 flank pain CT scans, and this is a few years ago. The mean age was 45. It wasn't skewed to the more elderly population that we might see with, from CT overall. And in fact, 4% of the uh, exams were in kids. We found that 4% had three or more flank pain CTs in that six-year period, and some had four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, and even 18 flank pain CTs in a six-year period. And when we estimate the dose from those, that patient who had 18 flank pain CTs, you can see he's poking up above 150 uh, millisieverts. Now, this is uh, concerning for uh, the fact that this can really, this additive effect can be quite problematic. And in fact, after I gave this lecture to the emergency medicine department at my institution, one of the residents came up and said, yeah, but do you know about Mrs. So-and-so? She's 28 years old with sickle cell anemia, and she's had 50 or 60 CT scans. You could make a much better graph with that one. And clearly, I decided not to make a graph of that patient. But I, I, I think that you'll find in any of our institutions, we have patients who have that much exposure to CT uh, throughout their short uh, illnesses. The answer, I think, is in diagnostic algorithms that, that help us, guide us to the appropriate imaging tests, going beyond appropriateness criteria to actually agree with our colleagues on how do we fit imaging into the clinical armamentarium. But this is very challenging. At Yale, we have one, and this is it. We uh, took us six months to work with OBGYN, internal medicine, pulmonary, ER medicine, and radiology to come up with the algorithm that we agreed to, and it's poorly adhered to. The physicians often deviate from it anyway. But this is our next challenge. Our next hurdle, I think, is to get to algorithms that guide us to appropriate imaging. Back to the flank pain CT. I was lecturing on flank pain CT a few years ago in Italy, proud of my lecture invented at Yale and showing all the examples. Uh, uh, I could uh, very, very proud of it. At the end of the lecture, the gentleman in the front row raised his hand, stood up, took his headset off, his translation headset, threw it on the ground in disgust and said, stupid Americans, my patient came to the USA for a holiday, passed a kidney stone, and they did a CT scan. Can you believe it? I mean, such a com contrast to what we, the way we practice. And he said, of course he had, a, you know, he had classic symptoms for passing a kidney stone. He has kidney stones. What did he have to do a CT scan for other than just to radiate them? And he has a point. He has a point. We need algorithms that really sort of standardize and dictate and guide us toward the appropriate imaging tests. One uh, bright uh, uh, spot on the future really is in the form of decision support. Decision support is a way that we can bring the appropriateness criteria or even better diagnostic algorithms once standardized and developed to the referring physicians and make them much more usable and integrate it into the workflow. It's been pioneered in Boston both at MGH and at the Brigham. And uh, this experience from the MGH shows their uh, experience over a seven-year uh, time frame for using decision support to try and manage uh, the growth of outpatient imaging procedures. And you can see that they were able to substantially decrease the growth of outpatient CT and ultrasound volume coincident with the use of uh, computerized order entry with decision support. And in fact, this graph from their paper highlights that to modification, the growth in CT was on a steady upward climb until they were able to get CT scans ordered with decision support, and then it leveled off in parallel to uh, that curve, a very compelling uh, uh, picture, if you will. And simultaneously across town at the Brigham, a very similar effort underway, or was underway, which has also been further advanced, and this is uh, using uh, a similar type of system to try and standardize how physicians do their, their, their job. This graph shows the variation in the number of MRIs for lumbar or low back pain, MRIs of the lumbar spine that were ordered by various practitioners. I've covered up their names. You can see that it goes from a very low rate of ordering to a very high rate of ordering all within their, their practice. So great variation on how people view MRI and how, what it should be used for. And in fact, Ramin Khorasani, who, who led this effort, I did a retrospective review and found that only 42% of patients probably had appropriate indications for MRI. But after he implemented decision support, that 42% went up to over 90%. Uh, because it requires the physicians to adhere to evidence-based guidelines in their ordering practices. So this is, the, this is the future, and this is, I think, what we need. The problem is, I can tell you in Connecticut, I've been trying to get decision support implemented for four years. 
And the big challenge is, I mean, there's no question that it would greatly uh, help us get to a point where physicians use it regularly through if it's linked to computerized order entry, and it would really provide a great opportunity to, to manage utilization. But the problem is that physicians aren't incentivized to participate unless we can find a good carrot to put in front of them. And that carrot is in the avoidance of the need to pre-authorize the tests from the third-party payers. If you're not familiar with this, most of the physician's offices, if you go to your doctor and he orders a CT scan, a PET scan, or an MRI scan, his uh, staff has to call your insurance company and wade through a series of phone calls and a phone tree, I should say, to finally get approved for your test. Uh, the chair of surgery in my department says he has two FTEs alone every day doing nothing but radiology preauthorization. They want me to pay for those FTEs, and I'm telling them, let's get the, the payers to waive it if we get decision support in place. And that's uh, the hope. I, I, I do have two payers now in Connecticut that have weakly agreed to this if I can get it implemented. But, boy, it's taken me a long time and a lot of sweat to try and get them to agree. The payers are not incentivized to participate because they contract with the radiology benefits managers, and in, uh, usually independent companies, although some actually own the RBMs. Uh, and these RBMs are designed to uh, fulfill designated utilization management functions. And their revenue, the money they earn, is tied to the dollars that they save the insurance company. And they have limited confidence that the rules that will be in the decision support engine will mirror their own rules. Even though they're not terribly transparent about what real rules they're using, they still uh, have this concern. So it's a big challenge, a big step to get past this. I applaud uh, those in, in Boston for leading this effort. And uh, I will say I think Massachusetts and Minnesota tend to be the states in the union that have the easiest opportunity to get payers to cooperate for reasons that go beyond this lecture. But uh, this is uh, our challenge nationally, to get decision support into uh, the clinical arena. Once it's in place, then analytics can help us go dissect back and really hone in on the types of exams that are most commonly ordered inappropriately. This is hypothetical data, not from any particular institution, which just shows how this might work, the number of appropriate exams, the number of inappropriate exams tracked and modified and corrected uh, with uh, this kind of tool, or displayed based on by, by referring physician, here coded by their referring physician numbers, even if we analyze whether it's appropriate and inappropriate, this kind of tool allows us to even retrospectively say, well, how many normal exams does this person order? How many abnormal? And try and get at the appropriate uh, ratio, if you will. If someone orders thousands of tests that are all normal, they're not being terribly discriminating in their judgment. With that, I have one last shameless uh, statement to make, and that is uh, I'm going to take five seconds to advertise the fact that it's taken me a year to get a medical physicist position approved for radiation monitoring control in my institution. We've had very few applicants. So if you have any friends out there, you physicists who are looking for a job, please have them see me after the lecture. And with that, uh, I hope you understand this issue better than this baby understood the risks of smoking in utero. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Uh, we do have a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody has some questions about appropriateness criteria or smoking in the womb or whatever. Anybody have a question? If so, could you please come up to the microphone? Okay, in the back. Do you want to come up to the uh, microphone, Andy? That's a great question, and um, I can say, try and answer in a few levels. First, um, about a year ago, we locked down all the protocols on the scanners so that the modifications can only be made by the CT manager. Um, but the protocols exist in two forms, right? They exist on paper that's uh, you know, uh, developed by our, our section chiefs or service chiefs for CT of the various services, but then they also exist on the scanner. 
And the concern is that they don't always match, right? Because what you thought you had versus what actually is implemented may not, may not be in agreement. Um, I, don't, I don't know if the scanner, I don't believe the scanner has a way to record who set the protocol on the scanner. That may vary manufacturer to manufacturer. I'll defer to you guys to answer that one. But, um, but at least when it comes to ownership of the protocol, theoretically, I do have the, uh, and I think most places have the, the, um, the service chief for each particular service, you know, the body CT service chief and the neuro CT service chief be responsible. But I don't know that most places have a physicist necessarily partnering with that individual to make sure that there uh, is a good uh, physics uh, support for that, which comes, brings me back to my shameless advertisement. So thank you. <laughs> No, I think that's exactly right, and I, I think that actually is largely why so many people are here today, because I think that's really the, the goal, is to really bring a, a, a collaboration together. Thank you. One, one quick question. Final question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephen Seltzer from the Miles Brick and Women's uh, Boston. So my bias about using decision support is obvious because we've been using it at all this a lot. I wanted to just make a commentary, which is it, it does seem very intimidating to uh, the prospect of being able to roll out decision support on a national basis, uh, particularly considering the opposite of Jimmy mentioned to uh, the payers uh, who are producing their tolerance for doing this. But on the positive side, we've got a 20 to $30 billion federal investment in the rollout of electronic medical records throughout the entire country. I think we're gaining ground with CMS uh, to have them believe that uh, decision support is a rational way to manage the cost of, of, of radiology utilization and therefore. So, uh, if we can be patient and, and uh, uh, deliberate and forceful, some of the mega trends may uh, move in our favor to have them uh, adopted more on a national basis. So, if we can keep our eyes on how this all plays out. That's a great, great point, Stephen. Uh, certainly, we all will keep an eye on that and hope, hopefully participate as well. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Very nice. <laughs>